Geeks and geek ets, gats and kittens, nerds and uh, nerd arenas. <laughs> and all the comic shops at sea. It's time once again for Ask Chuck Dixon, episode 125, where you, the general public, the great unwashed, <laughs> the masses, as uh, some refer to them, uh, you get to ask me questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living, luckily enough for me, is I write comic books. So uh, before we get to the action here, Midnight's War has 10 more days in its campaign. It's from Arc Tunes. It's a big honking graphic novel. Uh, the first from the Arc Tunes collection of graphic novels. It's about a world ruled by vampires. And the rest of us are all just serfs. We, we, we serve them as uh, both uh, food and uh, servants and whatever. Uh, you know, we're at the bottom of the food chain as a human race. Uh, is it an allegory? Is it a straight up horror story? You decide. I happen to think it's both. Uh, that's available through Kickstarter. And as I said, the campaign goes on for 10 more days. Check it out. The art is gorgeous. Uh, and it's the start of a new series. Uh, I'm already writing a spinoff. Midnight's War Night Streets series with this same artist. Uh, so anyway, let's get to our first question. Creeper Weirdo, I saw that Frank Miller started his own publishing company. It made me wonder what you thought about Miller's work like Sin City, Hard Boiled, or Ronin. I really love them. Well, um, you know, my problems, I have some problems with Sin City. First of all, it, these stories are extremely bleak. Uh, and I guess, you know, maybe when I was younger, I would have appreciated them more because, you know, you go through that bleak period in young adulthood where you think everything's hopeless. Uh, you know, most of us in our teenage years or a little bit older, young adulthood are a bit nihilistic. And, uh, these stories sort of fit into that mold. Uh, but yeah, I kind of, you know, I was older when I was reading this series in, in my thirties and it, it didn't work for me. It was just a, a little too much. And it is a pastiche, um, unapologetically so. I mean, nothing wrong with people liking it. Um, but, um, and then I, 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 I liked Hard Boiled, mostly for Jeff Darrow's art. But again, it's a, it's a pastiche. Uh, it just seems like an excuse for, you know, ultra violence, which I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not against. Um, but, you know, if it were wedded to a story that I could remember anything about, I'd, I'd probably be a bigger fan. But I can't remember anything about the story here. Uh, I remember a lot of Sin City because it's it's kind of um, it's kind of a one note story. You know, a guy's pissed off and he's going to kill everybody who pissed him off. Uh, that's kind of easy to remember. I don't I don't quite remember what Hard Boiled was about, except it takes place in a world that only Jeff Darrow could envision. Uh, it really is spectacular to look at. So uh, I probably enjoyed it more than Sin City for that reason. And one of the reasons I, I didn't like Sin City is that um, I, I know the source material. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as noir. It's not noir. It's not noir in any sense of the word. It's not neo-noir. It's got nothing to do with noir. It's hard-boiled. Sin City is hard-boiled. That's why he named his series with Jeff Darrow hard-boiled. And there was kind of a resurgence of interest in the hard world genre, which, you know, basically came along in the 50s with the paperback uh, explosion. And it was an explosion. Paperbacks were enormously popular in the 50s and enormously profitable for the publishers who published them. So things like, you know, Mickey Spillane and Jim Thompson and, and later on in, in the 70s and 80s, uh, James Elroy uh, kind of, you know, have these hard-boiled heroes that I think really grew out of um, the desire of World War II vets to have something to read that they could relate to. Uh, because, you know, if it, you know, maybe your granddad, maybe your dad uh, was in World War II, and they saw a lot of stuff. You know, uh, you know they, they were awakened to a whole new world. Uh, in, some, in some cases, uh, a horrible new world. I mean, an aspect of humanity they had never seen before. And so they, they, they come back home from the Pacific and from Europe, um, harder, uh, men, um, more cynical about life. And these books 
a lot of them written by vets, um, reflected that. And that's a lot. And the rise of film noir for the same reason. But film noir is different from hard boiled in that I hate to go into a lot of detail, but you know this is what Sin City is about. Uh, this is what a lot of Miller's work is about. Uh, film noir is um, Cornell Woolrich, who wrote a lot of terrific crime fiction, said that film noir was the everyday gone wrong. In a film noir story, you don't have the the tough guy hero. Um, you know, that's the hero or the protagonist in a film noir story is generally a normal person or maybe someone with a checkered past. Uh, and something happens in their life that makes them go down a dark path and they become a victim. They become a helpless victim of fate. And that's the best film noir stories. And if you think back to your favorite film noir, uh, that's what it's all about. The other aspect of film noir, and this is what's missing from, from Sin City in particular, is the everyday. Um, film noir succeeded because of the restrictions placed on film noir by the filmmakers, or by the studios actually. Film noirs were meant to be filmed with you know, B-level actors for the most part, on location to save money, and they were dark and shadowy because lights cost money. And <laughs> so the filmmakers... Uh, people like Fritz Lang and Anthony Mann, they were extraordinarily talented directors, had to work around these restrictions to create art. And they did. I mean, they took the restrictions and used them as a challenge to their talents. And so film noir movies are sort of dark and creepy and seedy because they, they, they weren't allowed to use a lot of lights. They weren't allowed, in, in the most part, to use studio sets. They had to film on location. And because of that, Film noir movies take place in a world we can recognize, or at least a world the people in the 1940s and 50s could recognize. And it's very important in film noir, film noir to establish that realistic, relatable world, that every day gone wrong. The part of that equation you need is the everyday part. So a lot of attention is paid to a film noir to scenes like this. I mean, this is obviously not a set. It's shot in an actual drugstore. This is from, uh, that's Neville Brand, shooting up the place in uh, DOA, uh, a great film noir, one of, one of the classics. And um, so you had to establish that. And, and for me, in any kind of genre fiction, you have to establish the everyday. You have to establish the norm, the baseline for what is normal before things go crazy. And that's true for film noir. It's true for any kind of crime story. It's true for comedy. It's especially true for horror that you establish a baseline of reality. Sin City has no baseline of reality. It exists in a world where everyone is nasty. Everyone is venal. It's always dark. It's always raining. <laughs> there's nothing real about this world. There are no, there's no every day. It's like this world has gone wrong. It's dystopic and weird and phantasmagorical from page one. And that's the problem I have with it. It, it delves way too hard into being a pastiche, a, a pantomime of a classic crime story. And, and that's, that's my beef with it. Um, now, if you enjoy it, it's probably because you've never been introduced to this genre or this is your intro to the genre of hard-boiled crime fiction. And that's cool. But I urge you to check out the source material, you know, Jim Thompson in particular, uh, but, but lots of other, you know, terrific writers in that genre. And... Uh, now, as for Ronin, I think the less said, the better. <laughs> I, I can't remember anything about this book, and it was much anticipated. It was, you know, his big follow-up to uh, all the work he had done on Daredevil and, and Batman. And I think, I think Frank fell into that trap. I mean, if you ever see a filmmaker, a director who's had a very successful film, a film that made big box office, everybody's talking about this guy, and everybody wants... So they can't wait to see this guy's next movie and his studios throw money at him because they think this guy's got the magic touch. And for his second big film, he always, almost invariably, he or she will make the movie I've been wanting to make since film school. <laughs> and that's always a mistake because the movie you wanted to make in film school is generally poorly thought out crap, but that, that you've sort of fallen in love with. Uh, and I think Ronin was that. I think Frank Miller... Had enormous success. DC threw money at him. 
and said, you know, we want to see your next work of genius. And so he probably did, Ronin is probably a project he had been wanting to do since he was like 17. And it's always a mistake. Um, if you listening to this ever become a successful film director, successful writer, successful novelist, successful comic book artist, beware. Beware of once you are successful, if you have some, you know, God bless you if you do, if you have some enormous success in comics, uh, be real careful about your follow-up. Because, um, you know, it can be a stumbling block. <laughs> And if you look, if you go on IMDb and look at hit films made by big directors and you look at the hit film and then look at the movie they made next, it's generally a bomb. Okay. Hey, creeper weirdo twin spin. This is going to be a spin-tastic uh, episode of this, by the way, and you'll see, you'll see why soon. Okay, Creeper Weirdo asks another question. AI art and the reaction to it freaks me out a little bit. I feel like it's people selling out art for a new fancy product. Like people want an art button product more than they want an artist with a voice. Let me give you an example and inflate your ego a bit. I have seen in your work two variants of a this woman is a bitch joke. That is you. It's not a robot repeating a phrase that it saw in a script or whatever. That's a joke you think is funny and that I noticed. Um... Yeah, you know, AI, there's no hand, you know, especially for comic fans. And you're probably almost everybody listening or watching this is a comic fan. And whether you know it or not, uh, one of the reasons you like comics is because it's a raw medium. It's not computer driven. It's not fancy. It's, a, you know, somebody writing and somebody drawing or somebody writing and drawing. And if you're like me, your favorite artwork is where you can see the artist's hand. And that's why artists become popular, because you like what you're seeing. You like that hand, and you want to see it. You don't want polished, super polished work in which you can't see that a human being drew it. And in the case of AI, no one drew it. I think AI art is uh, a good choice for small-time publishers who want to cover for their book, you know, and they don't have the money for a cover artist and they can sort of generate something. But I've seen horrible examples of AI art and I've seen, you know, pretty decent examples of AI art. Uh, but as always with a computer, because a computer is a moron, you know, I don't care about AI. You can call it artificial intelligence. It's not. It's still a computer. It's still ones and zeros. Um, computers are morons. So the, 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 the better you the better material you give it, the better the end result. And that's always been true. But I've seen some astonishingly bad AI art. Now, my danger warning for everybody <laughs> is, as a writer is uh, AI writing. And we already have this, if you don't know it. A uh, number of years ago, this has to be at least two decades ago, uh, somebody created a program for writing screenplays to make sure you don't leave anything out. <laughs> in other words, so no cliche goes unspoken. Uh, and it, uh, there's probably more than one of these. There's certainly more than one of these programs. And, of course, um, producers love it because they can basically tell writers what to do and say, well, the computer says. And I actually had a collaborator once. We were writing something together. And I won't say his name because I don't want to embarrass him or her. <clears throat> um who suggested running uh, something we were working on through this program. And I said, you ever, you ever suggest that again, I will never talk to you again. And the end result of basically AI writing a screenplay or a story is um, what we have today in cinema. Uh, we have stories that, you know, I mean, has there ever been a time in entertainment where so many forgettable projects have been greenlit? Um, just you, you literally watch the movie and forget it the minute you're done. And the problem with this is that you can say, well, it's a popcorn film and I was distracted and amused for a while, but were you, were you really, uh, or was the computer just, you know, tapping into whatever, uh, you know, endorphin producing material it needed to keep you engaged. 
And more and more as these programs are used and heated and become a template for writing, particularly in Hollywood, um, but, you know, I've seen it in novels as well, the more it takes hold, the less surprising the work is, the less engaging, obviously the less experimental. You're not going to see anything new in one of these stories. It's going to be a retread of a scene you've seen before and they hope you've forgotten, uh, that you don't remember the source material. And um, it's why you can, in, in a lot of productions, especially made for streaming productions, you can predict what the next scene is going to be based on what's going on right now. Uh, these, these movies and television shows telegraph like nobody's business, like nobody's ever telegraphed before. And telegraphing, which, which basically is uh, the filmmaker letting you know, giving you a hint of what is to come, that can be used very artfully. I mean, Hitchcock certainly telegraphed things. Uh, but when everything is telegraphed and every scene just follows like a row of dominoes and no thought has been put behind it, no imagination has been put behind it, and then you introduce producers into the mix, and what you get is a lot of recent movies that literally make no sense. They are just one thing after another. Uh, things happen only to advance the plot. Nothing happens organically. There's no, you know, great scenes. I, I always go back to, um, to um, the creator of Sopranos, whose name escapes me, David Castle, um, who said that... Um, he couldn't get Sopranos greenlit at any of the networks. He went to all of them because they didn't like any of the, you know, the, the, the moments, the character moments in the story. They thought, oh, these don't advance the plot. No, they don't advance the plot, but they inform us about the character. They had a layup motif. They had an element of every day. Uh, remember Tony with the ducks. Uh, every time um, he pitched this to the, networks they yeah you know, we'll take that duck scene out it doesn't advance the story and everybody remembers the duck scene that's seen sopranos and if you've seen sopranos you understand that there's there's the duck scene was important it was important okay the story could have been told without it but would it have been as interesting engaging poignant whatever would, would it have told us anything about tony soprano uh if that scene wasn't there wouldn't would, would we have missed that aspect of his personality that that dichotomy, that, that, you know, dualism that he had in his, that we all have our personalities, but Tony had it more than anybody else. So there you go. No AI in writing, AI in art. I guess it has its uses, um, but keep it away from me. All right. Gentle Savage, Mr. Dixon, you mentioned in your Bane birthday stream with Graham Nolan, which I suggest you find because that was a lot of fun. Uh, especially when Graham went off to use the bathroom and left me alone on his show. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> uh, birthday stream with Graham Nolan. You had a lot more ideas for where to take Bane's character before Tom King took over, assuming you don't have any interest in working for DC again. It would be cool to hear you elaborate more on what those ideas were. Well, basically, it, Graham and I had an idea from the very beginning with Bane. I mean, very, you know, even before we were done with Vengeance of Bane number one where we wanted this guy to go, where we would take this guy ultimately. And of course we did you know, a lot more with Bane through Nightfall and Vengeance of Bane 2 and Bane of the Demon. And Bane of the Demon, where he teams up with Ra's al Ghul in a very uneasy alliance uh, that goes all wrong. Um, that was our bid to like, say, this is, this is where Bane is going in his comic book career, as, in his career as a character. And... Um, when we did um, Bane Conquest, it was basically returning, like, like no time had passed between Bane of the Demon and, and Bane Conquest, returning to this theme of Bane wanting to be the king of crime. You know, our goal was that, that Bane becomes the Doctor Doom of the DC universe, that he is number one, top of the heap, because this is the way this guy was raised. He's just continuing his story from his origin, which is, you know, he had to be the toughest guy in prison to survive. And, and so then when he escapes, he wants to be the toughest guy in Gotham. He chooses Gotham as his starting point and he's going to bring down Batman. He's going to rule Gotham's underworld. And Bane of the Demon takes him onto a global stage with Ra's al Ghul. And basically he's 
He's learning from Ra's al Ghul about world domination. <laughs> and Bane Conquest takes him further along that chain. If you haven't read the 12-issue Bane Conquest uh, series, I suggest you do. Uh, because I, Graham and I think it's really cool. And DC didn't do a whole lot to market it. But, but we liked it. We enjoyed it. And, and, it, and it, it, it accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, which was um, the idea that um, um, Bane would be the king of the underworld. In Bane Conquest, he ultimately takes over Cobra, the, uh, the, the you know, Cobra with a K, the DC's big international crime organization. And, but we lay a lot of Easter eggs in Bane Conquest because he keeps encountering intergang. If you're, if you're a real DC freak, you know that Intergang is basically funded, operated, and run by Apocalypse. Basically, it's, it's a mafia with Darkseid as its godfather. And so we, we were going to, if we ever got a chance, to do another maxi series of Bane trying to hold on to his position as head of Cobra in a massive global gang war with Intergang, which of course would bring in, you know, parademons and you know, all the other uh, Kirby craziness. And, and, and at the end of that, really, really cement Bane, because Bane would come out victorious, uh, cement him as the Doctor Doom of the DCU. And that's where we were going, and that's what we were going to do. So, hey, gentle savage twin spin. I told you this was a spin-tastic episode, and I was not lying. Okay, uh, Gentle Savage wants to know, also on an unrelated note, are you a fan of Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, or Ray Donovan at all? Well, you know what, uh, Gentle, that's um, it's not really an unrelated question, is it? Because Bane is kind of an anti-hero. Uh, he's the hero in, in, in all of his solo stories. And that's much the same as the three properties you're mentioning. Yeah, huge fan of Breaking Bad. Uh, I like Vince Gilligan. Uh, who, who created it is, is or is, I'm stunned that it ever got on the air because uh, you know we're used to this kind of material now, but at the time it was groundbreaking, uh, and and this is um, in a lot of ways noir uh, because uh, you know Mr. White is a helpless victim. He's, he's dying of cancer. He's just trying to save his family, and he becomes embroiled in this um, drug trade. And, but his hubris takes over after a while, and of course his knowledge as a scientist and chemist, and um, he becomes the bad guy in his own story. Uh, so yeah, just, just awesome stuff, and, and very much the, the anti-hero. And it's spinoff, Better Call Saul. If there's a better television show uh, out there right now, uh, I know it ended. Uh, but if there's a better television show, I, I haven't seen it. This show is incredible. This does everything a spinoff should do. Um, it didn't try at all to repeat Breaking Bad, although it, it uses some elements, and obviously the series is a prequel to the things that go on in Breaking Bad, but it has a somewhat different tone. In a lot of cases, it's funnier, and uh, you know, Jimmy is a, it's just a fantastic character, just a fantastic character. As we follow him, we try to figure him out, and, and once again, it's a show like The Sopranos, like Breaking Bad, where the moral compass is all over the place. And you're always wondering, is Jimmy going to do the right thing? Uh, you know, and surprisingly, often he does. You know, he's not always serving himself, and that always comes as a surprise. But you know, a brilliantly written and acted series, and I do, I do love it a lot. Ray Donovan, another one. And, and again, all three of these shows have in common is they establish the everyday. Uh, Ray Donovan, I love. I mean, wh whoever came up with this idea of a Hollywood fixer, it was absolutely brilliant. And um, <laughs> and casting Lee Schreiber was their second uh, act of brilliance uh, because he just embodies this role as just this just super badass, TV's biggest badass. Uh, everybody loves the episode, the ball, or the the bag or the bat. Uh, <laughs> so um, you know, sort of showing the venal nasty underworld of Hollywood. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy the series. It's a great cast. Uh, John Voight he just kills in it. Um, all the other actors. I mean, this is an acting uh, festival. 
as far as I'm concerned. Just just awesome, awesome stuff. So yeah, I like all three of those shows. And if you haven't checked any of them out, you really you really should. If you like uh, crime dramas and interesting like grown up type television. JL, what can you tell us about your upcoming Conan novels that you haven't revealed before? Will you be writing a third tome featuring everyone, everybody's favorite Sumerian? Uh, these are the pencils for Dave Dorman's painting. His painting's done. I just wanted to show you the pencils because you're not going to see them anywhere else. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've written two. Uh, they've yet to be published. The first one's yet to be published. Um, and uh, the first one is The Siege of the Black Citadel. The second one is The uh, Caravan of, oh boy, what did I call it? Caravan to Hell, I think. Uh, and the third one, I haven't decided. I'm torn between two different kinds of stories. And um, I, I am going to write three of them, though it's not a trilogy. Uh, each one stands on its own. They come about, uh, they take place in different parts of uh, Conan's life. Uh, and they're just basically, uh, I wanted to write the ultimate Conan story, to my mind, you know, for me, you know, toy soldier fantasy Conan story. Um, set in the periods I like the best about Conan. And uh, in the first one, he's a mercenary. He's, he's with a besieging army that are trying to break into this uh, fortress. And uh, most of the action takes place there. Uh, but what they don't know is that uh, some nasty old wizard has um, summoned a really, really mean creature from another dimension to defend the castle. Um, and I had a lot of fun writing it. It's the most purple prose I've ever written. I tried to, I tried to stick to Howard's style of writing, um, used a lot of his like lexicon because people are comfortable with that Conan. I mean, words like Stygian just fit Conan so well. Uh, and, uh, I also stayed to, to the length of his novels. These are, um, about 30,000 words or, or more each, um, the Conan novels ran between 23,000 and 30,000 words. So I, I didn't want to write a fantasy by the pound book. Uh, these things get into the action, stay in the action. They're bloody and violent. And uh, while there's no sex in it, there's certainly suggestive material in, in, in the, in the books. So these are, you know, um, Conan the way I think Howard wanted to write it. Uh, the second volume is Conan as a desert raider and uh, involves um, a chase across the desert by, um, by a, a bunch of soldiers who really want to see Conan dead. Uh, and uh, the third one, I'm torn. I don't know if I want to do an adventure along the Black Coast. I, I love the idea of Conan going up some you know, jungle river, meeting some, some awful horror. And I'm torn between that or doing a straight up war story with Conan in it, you know, with, with, um, you know, war mammoths and all that stuff. I'm really torn between the two, but, uh, I will start the third one in the new year, but the first two are done. It's just a matter of, um, them being released. Hey, it's JL Twin Spin. Spintastic. If memory serves, you wrote a Wildstorm comic based on Nightmare on Elm Street. What was it like writing that series? Did you have any plans through the book? Had it continued past its eighth issue? Yeah, I've talked about this before. Um, hold on. I got that messed up there. I talked about this before. Um, and, you know, I might as well tell you the whole story. Uh, I think it was, boy, I can't remember if it was Scott Peterson or Ben Abernathy. I think it was Scott Peterson was editing at Wildstorm at the time. And Wildstorm got the new line horror characters. They got Freddy, they got Leatherface, and they got Jason. And Scott said, which one of these would you want to write? He gave me first choice. And I said, well, it's Freddy. I have no interest in the other characters. I, I like the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. I like the character. Uh, it's got a denser world. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more cerebral in, in its best examples it's more cerebral uh there's a lot of thought to it there's a lot of places to go obviously because we're in a nightmare world a dream world where almost anything can happen and so i jumped on it and i really enjoyed it and kevin west was my artist for most of these issues and did a bang-up job and i was told all along while writing these 
that my book was the only one making it past New Line without massive changes. The, the poor bastards writing <laughs> Leatherface and Jason were constantly having to do rewrites, uh, constantly being asked by New Line to change this and shift this around or got this wrong. And mine sailed through without a single note. And I was really happy about that because it told me that I got the character right, uh, which I didn't have any doubt about, but it's nice to hear, especially from the people who own the characters. And uh, everything was going along great. The, the book was selling well, and, and we were um, everybody was happy. And then someone at Wildstorm decided <laughs> that uh, I was too old school to be writing this book. Now, by old school, I think they meant I handed my work in on time and my stories made sense. Uh, so I was fired off the book um, and never wrote. I think I did write past the eighth issue, but they didn't use any of the material. And the eighth issue that I wrote was the last issue because they couldn't find a writer who could get past the new line people. Now, the new line wasn't happy. Now, now why? New line had to ask the question, what, what about the guy who, who was writing the book, the guy we liked? <laughs> I don't know what their answer to that was. Or why they didn't just think, hey, Chuck, could you come back? You know, we made a mistake, which is something you'll never hear a comic book publisher say. We made a mistake. We're sorry. Could you come back and write more Nightmare on Elm Street? But, uh, you know, it didn't work out, which is kind of, you know, schadenfreude for me. It's like, yeah, you fired me and then you failed. You didn't bring on anybody better. Uh, you know, apparently New Line liked old school writing. Because uh, what's not old school about Nightmare on Elm Street? It's not cutting edge avant-garde filmmaking. It's a horror movie, for God's sake. Uh, so yeah, where would I have gone? I would. I was playing with the idea of uh, introducing, if New Line was okay with it, a, a kind of recurring nemesis for Freddy Krueger. Basically, he wasn't alone in the nightmare world. That there was someone else who could be as big a badass as him. And just give him a bit of a challenge. Because, you know, um, we all love to hate this guy. And I would have loved to have put Freddy through the ringer with basically someone who just kick his ass. And if you read my stories, you'll see Freddy gets his ass kicked quite a bit <laughs> stories because I think that's the fun. Uh, is um, coming out the other end with the, uh, the dreamers, his victims, uh, on the winning side. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a JL triple spin. Aren't we all excited? JL had so many great questions and gave us this lovely picture of himself. Um, my next question is a professional curiosity. Do you work with an outline before writing a novel or comic? I've tried outlining, but I found my first draft veered off from said outline so much that I saw I could no longer work with one on any manuscript I've typed. What advice would you give to other scribes in similar situations as myself? Well, um, there's as many way to there's as many way to write as there are writers. You know, if outlines work for you, and I know a lot of writers. I mean, they 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 believe in the outline. They they live by and die by the outline, and that's great because that's how your thought process works. Apparently, uh, JL, you and I are closer. You know, more simpatico in the way we write. I will write chapter breakdowns in my novels sometimes, sometimes not. Most times I have a general idea of where I'm going. I know where I'm going to start. I know where I want it to end. It's that middle passage. And I find that even if you outline, that middle passage is tough. That's how do I get my characters from where I started them to where I want them to be at the end of the story and keep it interesting, keep it engaging. And that's that's the challenge in a novel because it's the length. Um you got to keep people interested. And, um, you know, there's lots of ways to do that. Subplots, and new characters, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to get too mechanical about it because I'm not. Obviously, I don't do outlines. If I was mechanical, I'd do outlines up the wazoo. But I don't. I never outlined comics. I would just figure out what's the opening scene and where do I want to end the story and then just fly. Once I had my opening, I was off to the races. I was writing, writing, writing and never looking back. But that's because comics are in my DNA. They really are. Uh, comic books are a second language to me. And, and you know, I never have a problem turning out a comic script because uh, I know what I like. And I know, I think I know what readers like. Uh, I guess I know what readers like. I'm still doing this after all these years. And um, so, you know, uh, 
so yeah, I mean, if you need the right outlines, write them. If you need the right character Bibles before you start your work, you know, by all means, do that. Uh, but if you don't, you don't. There's nothing wrong with that. I, and and please, I, I say this every time I talk about writing and how I write. I'm not telling you how to write. I'm telling you how I write uh, as an example, because I think that's interesting. When I read interviews with writers, I don't want them to tell me how to write. I want I want to hear what they do. You know, and then I can say, well, I would never do that, or that's crap, <laughs> or, hey, that's an awesome idea. Uh, but never read a how-to writing book. That's, that's what I'm getting down to. I'm warning you, because anytime I ever did it, I just I thought, geez, I'm going to go become a plumber. This sounds, this sounds like math, you know. So don't let anybody tell you how to write. Uh, so many people I meet, they say, well, I'm going to college so I can write my novel. Well, if you have your novel in your head, what do you need to go to college for? What are they going to tell you that's going to make your novel any better? You know, punctuation? That's what editors are for, you know. Uh, you have spell check, right? But just tell your story. Just And, and a lot of, like, uh, writers, wannabe writers say to me, well, I don't know where to start. I was like, well, just start anywhere because you don't write, you rewrite. Start your story anywhere. And if you decide after you've gotten, like, you know, 10,000 words in that that wasn't the right place to start your story, you can always go back and restart it, you know, start it in a different place. But generally, just get the material down. Get stuff on paper, and then you can play with it and mold it, you know, uh, like a sculptor with clay. Not comics. I can't rewrite. Rewriting comics is a pain in the butt because you've got to reformat. But rewriting prose, it's my favorite part of writing prose, uh, is, is the rewriting, the polishing up. So anyway, I want to tell you a little story. I told this story on with on Graham's show, the, the Bane birthday show, but a lot of you might have missed it. And I realized that he, Graham got a kick out of it, and I thought you might too. Um, back when I was in high school, I was on the high school newspaper. And one of the, uh, a girl who was on the high school newspaper, this is like junior year high school, she was telling me that she wanted to write a series of articles about students and their hobbies. <laughs> and I thought, that's, well, that's great. That would be a great series of writing. That'd be interesting. We would get to know our fellow students and their interests outside of school. And she says, yeah, but nobody wants to talk to me about their hobby. I can't get anybody to agree to an interview about their hobby. And I said, well, I collect comic books. And she said, see, that's what I mean. You, you don't want anybody to know that. <laughs> so uh, anyway. Let's get to uh, what you're reading. And what am I reading? What am I reading or what have I read recently? Um, I know, you know, admitting you like Dilbert is like admitting you listen to ABBA. Uh, but but sometimes with some people. But I like Dilbert. Uh, I, I enjoy the Dilbert books. And I got the most recent one, uh, which takes place during the second year of the pandemic. And... Um, it, the, the thing is, it's like looking back at the at the recent history and seeing, you know, where did Scott Adams get this stuff right? Um, he's, you know, he's always very cynical about things. But he was very cynical. Uh, Dilbert at heart is an anti-authority uh, comic book or comic strip. And um, he, um, he was very suspicious of, you know, COVID policy from the very beginning and has a lot of fun with it has a lot of fun with it in the strip. And, it, you know, a lot of it, we now know uh, he was on the right track <laughs> to be uh, a bit skeptical about things we were being told about masks and, and vaccinations and, and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's, you know, I always find the guy funny. And, you know, I, I know it sounds weird because the strip is done, you know, as basic cartooning style possible. Uh, but when you combine the words and pictures, the guy, the guy's an awesome storyteller. He really is. And, uh, in addition to, you know, um, very, very rarely hitting a false note in the strip, which is tough when you've got to do 365 strips a year, uh, you figure you're going to have a couple that are going to be duds. And it's very, very rare that one of these doesn't strike home in some way and, um, and are thought provoking in their own way and also warning of the dangers of technology and also the fallibility of the people who want to tell us what to do all the time, whether it be at work or the government or, or wherever. So um, got to recommend that. 
Now, another thing I'd like to recommend, and I think I've recommended this before, was uh, the history of Dell Comics. Um, Dell, it's called Funny Books by Michael Barrier. It's a exhaustive history of Dell Comics. Dell Comics was the probably to this day the most successful comic book company in America. Uh, they sold millions and millions of copies from the 40s into the 60s. Extraordinarily successful. They had their own distribution system, their own press. I mean, they, they just had it all. And they produced consistently excellent work. Even their poorest examples are at least competent the competently done entertaining comics. And they, they did all kinds of things from funny animals to Westerns to, you know, movie tie-in comics, crime comics, uh, action adventure, uh, anything you could possibly imagine uh, Dell Comics was into. And uh, Michael Barrier does a terrific job. I mean, this was a treasure trove for me because I knew nothing, nothing about this company. And it was very hard to find anything out about this company. Uh, but he dug deep. And, and got all the goods. So you have this history of the company and, and all of the massive talents who work there. John Stanley, uh, Gaylord Dubois, uh, Carl Barks, and, and how they came to work at this company and how they came to create the things they created. And uh, it's, it's, if, if you're interested at all in the beginnings of the American comic book industry, you couldn't start in a better place than this book. And I highly recommend it. Uh, I'm also still on a nautical fiction kick for some reason. I used to read a lot of it years ago, and I just sort of recently picked it up in the last few months. I'm still in the middle of The East Indiaman by Ellis K. Meacham. And it's, you know, typical nautical fiction, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, bow guns blasting and boarding parties and broadsides and all the rest of it. Uh, but what made it interesting for me was uh, it, it is about an East Indiaman. These were the ships that were um, run by the Bombay Marines, and they were a private navy who mostly served the East India Company out of England. And they sailed the Indian Ocean and South China Seas. Uh, basically, these were cargo ships, except they were armed to the teeth and uh, packed with fighting men because pirates and the French were always lurking around the corner. And this one takes place in the early 1800s. Uh, France and, and England are still at war. And uh, it involves um, the Percival, Percival, oh God, I can't remember the guy's name. Anyway, Percival is the <laughs> character. But he's a manly guy. He, he, he's, you know, he's more manly than the name Percival would make you believe. And uh, he... Um, he battles his way across the Indian Ocean and uh, has to put down a, a mutiny by uh, Sepoys. These are the, the Indian soldiers that, that serve the East India Company. And uh, it's good stuff. Good, rousing, ripping yarn. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Now, um, this book was recommended to me by the uh, multi-talented, awesomely talented uh, William Ray. Because uh, I mentioned on Facebook that uh, something about Matthew Perry's uh, <laughs> memoir, uh, something disparaging, and, uh, and but mentioned that I like uh, film memoirs if they're by interesting people and they and they wrote them themselves. And uh, William Ray said, "Well, you've got to read this one by Nick Nolte uh, because he did write it himself, and he said it's an excellent book, and he's absolutely right." Uh, you've seen Nick Nolte and stuff. I mean, he became a big star on TV uh, with Rich Man, Poor Man, and then went on to uh, The Deep, uh, which, you know, established him as a film star, you know, worth a million bucks a picture because uh, this movie was extraordinarily successful. And uh, he took The Deep. He didn't want to take the, This answers a lot of questions. I've, I've always had a million questions about Nick Nolte's career, and this book answers all of them. He's very, very candid, brutally candid at some points. Uh, but, but he, he, he took the deep after turning down lots and lots of movies and, but he kept turning down the deep. It was Robert Shaw who convinced him to do it. So it's a treasure hunting movie. What the hell? Just, just be in the movie. You know, it's going to be fun. Um, but you know, I love it when actors talk about the movies they were almost in, you know, and, and you can reimagine the movie with them in it. And, and two of them, which was a surprise to me, he was supposed to be the second lead in Slapshot under Paul Newman. He was supposed to be the younger uh, hockey player 
that would, would uh, eventually be played by Michael Ankeen. And uh, he was all set to be a slap shot. He was cast. He was there. He was on location. And he couldn't, he couldn't skate well enough. And he's an athletic guy, Nolte, former football player. He's an athletic guy, but he could not skate well enough to play a hockey player as much as he tried and kept injuring himself. And so they had to let him go and hire Michael Ankeen. But when he mentioned that, I thought, well, wow. I mean, what a great skater Paul Newman became because he's very, very good at skating. Very, very convincing as a hockey player in this film. But uh, that was sadly not to be a part for Nick Nolte. He was also... Uh, in, in the running for the lead in Apocalypse Now and actually thought he had it for a while until they called him and told him that they had chosen Harvey Keitel, who eventually would bow out, be replaced by Martin Sheen. It always fascinates me to know what, what, act, what movies actors were almost in. Um, but of course, you know Nick Nolte from lots of you know, action films and dramas and all the rest of it, like 48 Hours and things like that. But one of the questions I had going into the book is, why is Nick Nolte in so many movies I really love. I mean, he's in a lot of my favorite, absolute favorite movies, movies I watch over and over and over again. And, and why is that? And it's mostly because he uh, was very careful and thoughtful about the kind of movies that he wanted to make. And while he was on the set of The Deep, um, he met, a, uh, I think, a Czechoslovakian director who said, you, I want you to play the lead in my next movie which turned out to be Who'll Stop the Rain. This is absolutely one of my favorite films. Nolte is a uh, merchant marine who helps a buddy smuggle some dope out of Vietnam back to California, and uh, bad things happen from there. And uh, it's him and Anthony Zerba and Tuesday Weld. And um, uh, it's, it, it's just a, it's a thinking man's action film. It's, it's got a lot to recommend it. Beautifully shot in Mexico and, and Southern California and uh, just a real cool flick. And, and he's perfect as Ray Hicks, the, uh, the former Marine uh, who gets involved in all kinds of trouble. His next film was suggested to him because um, someone saw him reading the book on set, North Dallas 40. This was a, uh, a novel, a semi-autobiographical novel written by an NFL player. And Nolte wanted to play the part. And uh, his agent said, yeah, you're not right for that part. You don't want to be play a football player. But Nolte said, well, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to make the deal. And his agent said, well, you, you know, <laughs> you're an actor. You can't make deals. But Nolte went to the studio and pressed and pressed and pressed. And lo and behold, they gave him the deal. They put him in the lead, allowed him the choices in casting. They gave him a choice of three different producers and three different directors to work with him. And, um, you know, here he is in his, you know, basically third big A picture calling all the shots. And um, the day he signed the deal with Paramount, he fired his agent and manager. Uh, so, also, Cape Fear, uh, uh, Martin Scorsese's remake of the Gregory Peck, Robert Mitchum classic. Nolte's terrific in this movie as well. Uh, Thin Red Line as the hard driving uh, uh, commander of an army unit who's, um, you know, trying to hide his own weaknesses, his own doubts about himself, a very nuanced performance. And probably my favorite role of Nick Nolte of all time is The Good Thief. It's a remake of Bob Le Flambeau, a French crime thriller. Uh, it's made by Neil Jordan. And it's uh, <clears throat> Nick Nolte is an expat American living in Paris who's dealing with uh, an art heist, uh, dealing with his own heroin addictions, something that, Nick Nolte sadly knew a lot about, and uh, I, I can't I can't even begin to count how many times I've rewatched this movie. It, there, there is so much great material, so many great scenes. Um, the, the the resolution of the film, Nolte's fantastic in it. Everybody's great in it, uh, and I see something new every time I watch it. Uh, I highly recommend it. Now, another question I've always had about Nick Nolte and his films uh, that this book answers is what happened to Raquel Welsh in Cannery Row? It was touted, it was publicized that Nick Nolte and Raquel Welsh were going to star in a film version of John Steinbeck's Cannery Row. And I, boy, I was looking forward to it. I heard a lot about this movie and everything else. And then 
And then we heard Raquel Welsh was out of the picture. She was gone and replaced by Deborah Winger. And along with that came these stories that Raquel Welsh was difficult to deal with. And she made a lot of trouble on set. And she had to be fired. So she was uncooperative and making trouble and everything else. Now, if you know anything about Hollywood, that's sort of like uh, a euphemism for she wouldn't sleep with the director, which I think that's what was going on here. Nolte doesn't know why the director suddenly turned on her and fired her for being late. And the exact opposite was true. Rocky was there before anybody else because she thought she was a little too old for this role. And she was on set before anybody else so she could spend extra time in makeup in order to play a character a little bit younger than she was. And she was fired, and then they brought on Deborah Winger, who turned out to be a nightmare, an absolute nightmare, uh, and was everything that the director claimed that Raquel Welsh was. And this made things tough for Raquel Welsh's career because all of the stories about Deborah Winger were being applied to her by the studio. In other words, when Deborah Winger would do something crazy on set and endanger everybody or play a nasty prank, or show up late, or disappear for three days, so they had to stop shooting, the studio put out that, it, that, that well, the, Rocco Welsh did that. And we know Rocco Welsh is not, uh, she's, a, she's a trooper. She would never do that. She wasn't difficult to work with, because the, the proof for me is that on an episode of Seinfeld, she plays herself mocking the image of how difficult she is to work with. Now, nobody who's difficult to work with would do that, <laughs> make fun of the negative aspects of this image that were unfairly applied to her. But I, I love that this book tells that story and we get to learn what the hell happened on that set. Um, now, oddly, there's films he, he does not mention. Uh, and uh, one of them is another of my favorites, Farewell to the King, in which he, it's a World War II story in which he plays a uh, shipwrecked uh, Navy guy who ends up becoming the uh, warrior king of a... Uh, of a tribe on an island held by the Japanese. That's a John Milius picture. It's got some awesome stuff in it. Another grown-up action film. And uh, he does not mention the film, and I gotta wonder if there's the fact, I can't imagine he didn't like making it, but I think maybe, uh, he has a history of drug abuse, maybe he couldn't remember a lot about this shoot, or remember enough to talk about it, but he didn't, or maybe he didn't like the movie in the end result, because it was, it did bomb at the box office, unfortunately. Uh, Milius thought this was going to be his Lawrence of Arabia, and it just just turned out to be a big dud. But you know, I've watched this movie multiple, multiple, multiple times, and I, I, I you know, as with the others, see something new in it each time. Another movie he never mentions is his actual first feature film. He kind of pretends that didn't happen. Uh, Return to Macon County, which is a sequel to Macon County, <laughs> Macon County Line, it was a return, sequel to Macon County Line, which uh, two drive-in pictures produced by. Max Baer Jr., who played Jethro Bodine on Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, and both these movies are fun, drive-in fare. Uh, but I guess Nick Nolte didn't want to, you know, remember that he was in this, uh, even though uh, apparently this is where he began his lifelong friendship with Don Johnson, because they're, they're both in the movie. Another one he doesn't mention is Extreme Prejudice, but I'll give him a pass on that because it is a gonzo 80s action film. And there's nothing wrong with that, but he doesn't necessarily have any reason to be proud of this movie because it's, it's sort of a uh, uh, psychedelic retake on wild, the Wild Bunch. It's, a, it's kind of a weird movie. It's got, it's, it's, it, bits and pieces of it are great, but the whole thing is a, is a huge bloody mess, emphasis on bloody but I still enjoy it. It's, uh, it's as close to a guilty pleasure movie as I've ever watched. Uh, I only say that because I don't have guilty pleasures. I don't think you should be guilty about your pleasures. If you like something, you'll like it. Uh, so anyway, brunobookstore at gmail.com. That's where you got to go if you want to get your spins, baby. If you want a twin spin, triple spin, the most likely place you're gonna, I'm going to find you is brunobookstore at gmail.com. You can ask questions here below the video. Chances are I might miss them. You can ask on Twitter. You can ask on Facebook. I might miss you there. I might miss, but I never miss questions at brunobookstore at gmail.com because I check that, that uh, email every day, sometimes several times a day. While I still got you, um, first kill, Rambo's uh, first tour in Vietnam from Sublato Comics is still available on Indiegogo. It's in demand. 
and we've reached our goal, but we want you to have this thing, man. And uh, there's stretch goals and such like that. Uh, Sylvester Stallone's concept, uh, me writing the script, some awesome artists on the art. Uh, if you if you know the the critical drinker from his videos, uh, he's written a bonus uh, major uh, Troutman story. Uh, Troutman set in uh, Korea uh, as a young man. Uh, he's written that, which is really cool uh, for his listeners. And um, you know, check it out. It's in demand. I don't know how long it's going to be up, but there's no rush on that. Like there is on Midnight's War. Only 10 days left on Midnight's War. So uh, check out First Kill, uh, Rambo's first tour in Vietnam, graphic novel. And that's it for me this week. Uh, covered a lot of ground. Probably told you more about Nick Nolte than you cared to hear. Uh, <laughs> but it's my show, darn it. Uh, so uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, liking, subscribing, spreading the word, and I'll see every single one of you, I hope, down the road.